my friends, it's so good to be with you all again. And uh, what a joy to see how this gathering has grown on a weekly basis to uh, uh, to provide a space uh, for us to come together uh, from across the church. And uh, I am just so pleased um, when my colleagues in the Conference of Bishops have been sharing about this and taking advantage of this opportunity and, uh, and taking time to, to be with you all. Uh, and particularly today, we are really blessed to have uh, Bishop Eggensteiner, Bishop Kempel, and Bishop Curry joining us. Um, you know, they, they represent in themselves and their locations so much of the diversity of this church that we have. And uh, I think that's a gift we have to share with each other right now because the experiences we're having of this, of this COVID-19 crisis are uneven across the church and across our nation and world. Uh, and um, Bishop Eggensteiner in Metro New York is dealing with this in an acute way that I can't fathom because we aren't here. And, and so I try to share stories that I get there to say, people, this is something we have to take very seriously uh, because there are folks who are suffering and dying amongst us and they're part of our community. So I am just so, again, so grateful for their time today, for your time, uh, for Jill and for Jason and ELCA Coaching bringing us together. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand this over to Bishop Eggensteiner. And uh, again, thank you so much for this time that you are all sharing with us. Well, thank you for inviting me and uh, taking the time to listen to my story, story of the Lutheran Church here in Metropolitan New York and its surrounding area. Um, Bishop Bronberg and Jill, I'm going to ask you both to try and keep me honest. I'm a preacher and 10 minutes is a variable kind of time frame but I want to respect my two colleagues and give them the time they need. So feel free at any time to be just doing this to me and I'll, I'll know what you mean, okay? So today has been a particularly bizarre day in the midst of a bizarre time. The reason I say that is because an article came out today, a lead article in CNN about the experience of our parish in Manhattan that has emerged Anglo-Latinx congregation that has experienced 45, 44 deaths as a result of the virus. Um, five of them in the Anglo congregation, 39 of them in the Latinx congregation. And uh, sadly, this is newsworthy. It's, uh, I say it's bizarre because I'm getting texts from people saying, hey, I saw you on CNN. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, I, I think though what that highlights is, is how, how much of a challenge this is and how we saw through our own reaction and feeling to what we're going through at this point. Um, let me also say, just to put this in context and not, not give it to sensationalism, the experience of that congregation is unique in terms of the number of deaths. It's not unique among our Latinx congregations in terms of the number of people infected with the virus, but in terms of those who have succumbed to it, it's a very unique experience. Um, so, uh, what are we doing about it? How are we handling this? I've learned a number of things about myself and about the church in this experience. I was elected bishop last May, began my service in August, and was still getting my feet wet in terms of what it meant to be a bishop. And then this thing came along um, and has forced all of us to understand better what it means to be church. When we talked last May, I think I was, I was two days elected and, and our communications person said, so what do you want our, our theme to be for Synod Assembly in May of 2020? And I was like, I don't know, let's go with the great ELCA phrase, we are church together. We're definitely learning what that means. And I'm, I'm trying to bring that message to all of our congregations here in Metropolitan New York, which... You might not think of it at first, but it's actually a very diverse area because of our geography. It goes from rural to suburban to very urban inner city congregations. Um, our governor, uh, Andrew Cuomo, has a saying. He says that we are New York tough. And when you drive down the highways in New York, there are now lighted signs um, that say, New York tough, cover your face in public, um, which is kind of an interesting message, right? Uh, but when our governor has his press conferences, he ends always with these words, we are New York tough, New York smart, New York united, New York disciplined, and New York loving. Um, and those seem to be good descriptions of what our church is being called to be in these times. 
amidst the push for congregations to gather in person, we're trying to recommend, which is all we can do, that that not happen yet for the sake of the most vulnerable in our congregations, recognizing how difficult it is for those who are isolated. I am very blessed to have an absolutely amazing, amazing staff. Um, uh, they're all very, how do I put this, even keeled, recognize that we're in this together and, and we're able to gain strength. God works with us through one another. So that's been very sustaining. But the other thing that I have to say to you all that I found very sustaining um, as we have a Roman Catholic priest who runs a food pantry and a homeless shelter in one of our church buildings. And early on in this, he called out his fellow priests and said, uh, and bear with me here, his words, if you're not out on the street with those who are hurting the most, you're not following Jesus. That's very judgmental. But I felt convicted by those words. So I think that was his intention for people to receive that as they could. And I realized that for part of my own mental and spiritual health, I needed to be out on the streets with those who were hurting the most. So every weekend, um, I've, I've been doing social ministry, right? Which is, as you know, being with people and helping them in their time of need is life giving. So I've been at food pantries and soup kitchens. Um, and last Tuesday, I helped with food distribution for members of the congregation that has been hit so hard by this virus, St. Peter's. And there we were in a produce warehouse in the Bronx, packing bags for distribution. And the pastor introduced me to one of the guys who was there packing bags and said, this is, this is Juan. We did his brother's funeral yesterday. He died of the virus. And, and what I wanna communicate about that is that there was Juan the day after his brother's funeral helping other people because that was healing and that was sustaining and that was hopeful for him. And he needed that human connection and that ability to feel that he wasn't simply a victim of this uh, disease, but that he had still some agency and that agency was worked out in service, right? And in, in walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Um, and that was just so meaningful and powerful for me. So how are we sustaining ourselves? Um, by being community together, by being church together, by reaching out to those who are in need in some uh, very uh, dire ways, but doing the best that we can to lift them up, which sometimes just means a phone call um, so that they know they're not alone. Um, bishop Brownberg can tell you, Bishop Kempel can tell you um, something I'm still learning. Once the bishop calls people like, wow, I feel so much better already. And all I said was, hi, it's the bishop. So uh, to use the authority of our offices as bishops and pastors to to help people know that they're not alone, that they haven't been deserted. Um, the other thing I want to say that is really, really important to me is that it's not solely or exclusively here in New York, but certainly uh, powerfully here in New York, this virus has exposed some deep fault lines in our culture and in our society. The fact that the people of in our communities of color that our marginalized, marginalized communities are those most deeply affected reveals that we have a lot of work to do. That, um, that members of our Latinx communities don't have the option to stay home because then the choice is go out and get sick or stay home and starve. Um, one of our pastors called asking for financial assistance and she said that what's happening is that because member of our, members of our Latinx community can't work, landlords are threatening them with eviction. New York State has an eviction on hold order, but the landlords are circumventing that order by not calling the courts, but calling immigration and uh, calling ICE agents to come and expose these people as undocumented folks and then want to send them back home in the midst of this pandemic. So the fact that that's even an option is appalling and a, a place where our church is being called to speak out loudly on behalf of those marginalized people. And that's also in my understanding how we walk alongside Jesus by speaking for those who are the least, who are the most overlooked, who are the most vulnerable, and yet who are sustained by their own deep faith that somehow God will make a way for them in the midst of that. And if we don't stand up and, and walk with them in solidarity, we are definitely missing 
an opportunity, um, as the priest said, to be out among the people that, that Jesus loves. Um, so that's another, another challenge uh, for me um, and another opportunity that I feel for our church. Um, how am I doing on time? I'm, I'm about up. You don't want to tell me. You can tell me. <laughs> Bishop, you're speaking so powerfully. No one's going to want to cut you off. But uh, it would, Bishop Curry is here now, too. And we'd love to hear from Kemple, as, Bishop Kemple as well. But um, your stories are, are touch, uh, powerful. Thanks. Can I close with another thing that's been sustaining to me? And then I'll, I'll be happy to turn it over. Thanks. It's been Romans 5. Amazing words from St. Paul. He writes, we boast in our sufferings. Wrap your head around that, right? We boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope, sorry, hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts. Thanks. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. And um, we are grateful for your ministry and what you do. And uh, thank you for that. Bishop Kempel, thank you for being here with us from the other side of the country, geographically speaking. Yes. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. And uh, Paul, I just want to say that you have been held so tightly in my prayers because I cannot even imagine uh, doing this just a few months in. Um, it's overwhelming enough. And then to throw something like this um, at the level that you've had to embrace it uh, and enter into it, I just, I can't even imagine um, except to give thanks to God that you're there um, because because this is your call. Uh, and I'm both grateful for that and sorry for that. Because <laughs> it's a tough call. Um, the experience that I've had in my synod, my, I serve the Northwest Intermountain Synod, uh, which is, the, is formerly known as Eastern Washington, Idaho, but we actually span four states. Uh, and so the, the synod chose to change their name to reflect that. Um, I've got congregations in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Wyoming. Um, and so trying to have a, a cohesive uh, response to COVID-19 across four different states um, is challenging at best. Uh, we have counties that have had no instances of COVID-19. Um, we have counties which have been hit very, very hard. Uh, to echo Bishop Eggensteiner, um, Yakima County, which is uh, in eastern Washington, is one of the hot spots on the west coast right now. Um, and their population is primarily migrant and undocumented workers, um, as well as being home to the, the Yakima Indian Reservation. So we have uh, a lot of systemic racism that we're dealing with in those areas um, that these folks don't have access to the things that people with white skin have access to. Um, and that's where we're seeing a lot of our numbers jump. Um, our government, uh, our governor in Washington has introduced a phased return to normal program. Um, some of our counties in Eastern Washington have been granted approval to jump right into phase two uh, because they have fewer than 75,000 people in the county. So um, some, of our, some of our being lightly struck by this COVID-19 virus is because we don't have the population density um, that Bishop Eggensteiner and Bishop Curry deal with in their synods. Um, there's just not as many people out here. Uh, so that is, is a blessing. Um, we, we don't have to worry about entire buildings um, of, of apartments being taken out. Uh, by one person who's infected. We just don't have that kind of density. Um, I learned yesterday uh, that the next town over, uh, Kennewick, Washington, is one of the hot spots being monitored by the government because they had a 75% increase uh, in COVID-19 cases. Um, 
in a very short amount of time. So what we're seeing is because it hasn't, because of the, the lack of population density, um, most of the cases in Washington have been in King and, um, uh, help me out, Eric, what's the one north of King County? Uh, I forget now. <laughs> I know, I'm blanking on it. Uh, Homish. 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 Yes, thank you. Uh, those, those are very densely populated uh, counties in Washington state. Um, and most of the, the, the things that you're hearing about coming out of Washington state are coming from those two counties. Um, so we're, we're opening this, this phased um, return to normal. Um, we are much more sparsely populated over on our side of the state. And so people have not taken it seriously. Um, and I think that's why we're seeing our numbers beginning to spike, uh, because uh, we are, we are, uh, my synod is, is typically a red synod as opposed to a blue synod, if we want to attach those sorts of labels to it. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, resistance um, to just common sense measures. And so um, I've spent a lot of time feeling like, I've, uh, like I'm just screaming and no sound is coming out. You know how you have those dreams where you're trying to warn someone that something terrible is coming and you can't make any noise? Um, that's been my life uh, because I am looking at places like New York and Chicago and, and um, our colleague uh, Bishop Shelley Wee in Seattle. Uh, I am looking at those places and I am seeing those numbers and, and I am just deeply distressed that we're in the very early days of this and I'm already having people think that it's made up or a conspiracy theory or you know um, so that's been a real struggle um, the major source of news in my context is Fox News um, how do you how do you combat that <laughs> with reason and science um, it's a tough thing so um, that's you know that's that's where I am. I'm not dealing with death. Um, the sense of it isn't in my nose probably the way it is uh, in Paul's nose. Um, but I'm afraid that we're going to get there. Um, we have congregations pushing really hard to go back, really hard to go back, and I am doing everything I can to slow them down. But our polity is such I can't forbid it, um, and, and that breaks my heart. Most of the time, I don't want that kind of authority, um, but this is one time when I would really like to have to be able to say, just stop, stay, stay home, um, you know. And, and I think about the rostered leaders who are in, in vulnerable groups for age or, or medical conditions uh, that we don't want to have disclosed to their congregation. How do they say, I can't go back to, to leading worship? Um, so it's, I mean, it's hard. It's hard in different, different ways, probably, um, but also hard in some of the same ways. Is that 10 minutes? I don't know. I'm kind of like Paul. I'm a preacher. I go five minutes or I go 25. There's very little in between. <laughs> He's going to say you got two. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so I've, I'm trying to utilize social media a lot. Uh, to get information out, um, which means I'm getting information out to people who aren't necessarily in my synod, um, and and I'm I'm hoping that that is is okay with their bishops. Um, I'm trying to just push as much information out as I can, trying to filter some of it to to do uh, to try and address just the information fatigue we're all under. Um, and, and still be that person who can come in and say, hey, it's the bishop, and they, everybody can kind of suddenly breathe. Um, okay, the bishop's here. Okay, it's going to be all right. Um, and I have no idea why uh, the bishop showing up causes that reaction, um, but that's one of those uh, mysteries of the faith, I think, that we get to be keepers of, and so, or stewards of, and so I just try and lean into it and offer what hope and comfort I can. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop Kemple, for your sharing of a very different context. And I think that's, again, as I said at the beginning, the richness of coming together uh, as church. We have these contexts in our midst, and, and we can share these stories, and then we need to have space to share those stories 
Uh, I did see that Bishop Curry is uh, with us. Uh, so uh, thank you, Bishop Curry, for being with us. Another very different context, uh, Metro Chicago Synod, and another uh, new bishop amongst us um, yeah. has been in office for a year. So Bishop Curry, thank you so much for your time and, and your busy schedule. Thank you. Uh, uh, if I can get a thumbs up, can you hear me? Okay, thanks. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to be with you. And uh, again, uh, thank you, uh, Paul, for sharing, as well as Kristen and Eric. Uh, in Metro Chicago, I, I've just been honored that uh, there are some opportunities for us to be divisive. We know that our African descent and our Latin and Latinx communities are, have been hardest hit. They have the fewest resources. And this pandemic has given us an opportunity as a church to dig deep into how we even start our African descent and Latinx communities in our church. Typically, it's after resources in a community have left and the new inhabitants of the community inherit buildings that are aging and having issues. And that's normally how we form them. And so when we begin to look at resources like PPP with Metro Chicago, uh, we, we've had a lot of success, but to our knowledge, only one African descent uh, congregation has received a loan. Only one Latinx community has received the loan. So there are a bunch of opportunities for us to be divisive, but the Senate has uh, really responded. Our council has really responded and has said, how can we do things to make sure that, that we pay attention to those that are on the margin, those that are being left behind. And we are seeing a, 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 clarion call, a rallying uh, uh, around those uh, uh, congregations, those new starts, those socks, those partners um, that would otherwise be left behind as a result uh, of this pandemic. So um, there, there is a bit of a good news. There is this sense of coming together. There is, uh, I just got to say this, the sense of, uh, of a grace period for myself, where people have allowed me to, um, to be able to lead and share in a way uh, that has been really affirming for myself. This pandemic has allowed us, because we're in eight conferences, each conference has about 25 to 30 congregations, to know each other in a way that uh, maybe we haven't done in a while. It's allowed our deans to uh, take on a leadership role um, that has been really inspiring to see. Uh, I stay in a part of town that has uh, some of the highest uh, COVID-19 um, infections. Um, and I've just seen just a lot of uh, coming together, a lot of work. Um, it's difficult at times. Um, so I, I, I'm just really encouraged. Um, I, I'll stop there to just, just say that I, I've, I've loved the way that uh, Churchwide has responded. I, I am just honored the way fellow bishops and senates have responded. So while um, there, there are feelings of just unreadiness. There is a, a sense of uh, gratitude um, for how we've come together just as a church. Thank you so much, Bishop Curry, and uh, for your witness and your word and, and for an encouraging word. Uh, that This is a time that we can learn and develop relationships in ways that we haven't had to um thank you all i know that uh, this is a little different than we've had on other wednesdays um, but to hear from these three leaders of our church um, is inspiring to me 
as their colleague in the conference, but I pray is inspiring to you all as uh, leaders in this church, whatever your role is. And uh, coaching is such a blessing to help us to, to develop ourselves and our leaders. Thank you, Jill, for organizing this. Um, wrangling um, bishops to get up to a time is a, is a task. Uh, and we are grateful for, for your time today. So thank you all. Paul, Yehel, Kristen, God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thanks. With that, I, I want uh, my colleague Jason to get ready with his cell phone part. Another part of um, our purpose for gathering today and inviting these particular bishops and, and as you represent all of the bishops across our, our denomination and our synods was to provide a sense of love and support for one another. So in an effort to show that and do that, I, I invite all of us to make the little heart sign up in our screen and Jason's going to take a picture of it. And this is our way of saying, we love you. We are, are doing everything we can to shine the healing love of God on each and every one of you and to honor um, the, just the amazing work that you're doing. Um, I'm getting choked up again, just remembering, especially Bishop Paul sharing um, and, and just reflecting that hope that we have in Christ to one another. It's just so important. Um, and, and to bear witness to another person's testimony is part of what we're called to do as disciples of Christ. So thanks to each of you for showing up today to bear witness to how these leaders are, um, are providing leadership and encouragement and hope to the people that God has asked them to accompany and serve in this just crazy upside down time. So, so thank you to each of you. Um, and as we use the, the lens that these beloved bishops have put before us to consider our own experience with COVID-19 and how we are seeing grief and hope, we are going to move into our, our small groups. And bishops, I have put each of you into a small group, so I hope you have the capacity to stay. Um, know that God goes with you in these conversations, and this is a time for you to be able to, to share to listen or to simply be. Your coaches will invite you to reflect on, again, where you are at in your journey and how this information that was shared, how it's affecting how you might take your next most faithful step forward. So with that, I'm going to open the rooms. Um, so with that, welcome back to the, the large room, and I'm wondering, how did these discussions go for you? And I'm going to call on a couple of specific colleagues. If you have something that you just really want to share, please also raise your hand. But first, I'm going to call on uh, my colleague, Bishop, or <laughs> Jennifer Long. I've now promoted you to Bishop, just so you know. <laughs> Jennifer, are you still on? Man, that is the quickest promotion I have ever gotten, <laughs> ever. And um, I have a whole lot of respect for the bishops, the work the bishops are doing. I am not sure I want that job. Um, I was in a really powerful breakout room where they were talking about the gift of opportunity that this happens to be offering to congregations and the creation of digital campuses and what that looks like and what it means to reach out beyond borders that um, before this, um, and, you know, definitely years ago would never have even been an option. So it's just such a privilege to be part of such a hopeful conversation. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, I'm not seeing any hands up. I'm going to call on my colleague, Johan Berg, if you are still in the room. Yeah, I'm here. Um, boy, our group was a uh small and mighty. Uh, we were recognizing how political divisions in the country do, are, are, are making the being together difficult, but that, the, that we as a church in being church together have a different uh, tone and a different way. And to experience that together means uh, sometimes difficult and, and hard conversations, but really important and good ones. Uh, the other thing that came out of our little time was um, how communi just communicating as, as leaders, really, is going to be, continue to be so vital for 
making real how church, how we are church uh, together. Um, some people are feeling like, yeah, we're not so much together. Others are feeling like, yes, we are. We even heard that from our, from our bishops, a real strong sense of being together. Uh, but in other places, maybe not so much. So the more we can be proactive in providing and reaching out to include people, I'm just thinking on a conference level, um, not everybody's connected. Every, some people are really there, some not. How can we really take, you see this as an opportunity to uh, support each other and make sure communication um, holds us together. So uh, yeah, it was a good, good group. Okay, all right, thank you. And, and John, I see you raising your hand. I found that people in my group weren't aware that uh, our uh, presiding bishop will be preaching on, I believe it's uh, Pentecost. And in my synod, the Northwest Washington Synod, our bishop, Bishop Wee, has uh, provided sermons that congregations can use. And I think many of us have found it very helpful to help our people understand that we, we are more than just a congregation, that we are a synod and that we are a national church. And so I'm hoping that a lot of us use uh, Bishop Eaton's sermon on Pentecost and, and perhaps encourage our bishop to provide sermons that we can all use in a, now and then in our Sunday services. So just thank to, you. Oh, go ahead. Jason. Also, just to clarify, John, thank you. Several people in the chat wrote it. It's tr uh, Holy Trinity Sunday on June 7th. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Thank you again for um, all of you that have joined and for sharing your insights. I hope that you will return next week. Our guest speaker will be Linda Stott. Um, Linda of, of Homegrown Faith Ministry, longtime ELCA leader. She's probably best known for her recent publishing. It's actually her life's work of the Generosity Project. She's going to be talking specifically about how we speak in healthy and Christ-centered ways with our children about COVID-19. Here as adults, we're just barely getting our footing and able to take a step forward. And, and our conversations with our children have um, in some ways, largely been overlooked, and Linda's going to give us some great tools of how to conduct those conversations. So we hope that you will come back next week. Um, and with that, I'm going to invite our colleague, Pastor Tara Lynn of the Southwestern Pennsylvania Synod, to bring us a final word of blessing and prayer. Hi, everybody. It's really good to be here with you today and to hold this space together. Um, I don't know about you, but I really appreciated these weekly opportunities to come together and to see how it is that we are together in this time. Um, I just wanted to share a brief sort of gathering up of uh, kind of things we've talked about um, and then a brief prayer and a blessing to send us on our way. Um, so I don't know about you, um, but we here just outside of Pittsburgh or in the Pittsburgh area went into quarantine of some sort beginning about March the 15th. Um, and in my house, we decided not to count the days because we thought that would be an awful thing to do. Um, but what we did decide to do inadvertently was we started counting the Sundays of the coronavirus. So the first Sunday of the coronavirus, the second Sunday of the coronavirus. It was so inadvertent, but we've kept it up for some strange reason. And I have a six-year-old son, and about the second Sunday of coronavirus, somehow my husband and I were talking about all the things and all of a sudden, my son just outburst, I don't ever want to hear coronavirus again. And then he stomped down the hall like he was 16 and in an odd show of things, slammed his door shut. And so we realized, right, like most of us, something was up. And so when we talked to him after that, uh, what we found out is he said, there's just a sadness that hides inside about all of this. And as I listened on our phone call today, and as I've listened over the last several Sundays and weeks of coronavirus, or however long you've had, um, I hear this, right? The sadness, the weariness, the grief, the wondering. Our bishops today shared just powerful stories and powerful experiences about what they're living through, where they are, and how this is all happening. So as I thought about this, um, the way that grief is big in our life right now, um, I thought about the fact that for my son, one of the things we said was, well, we're in this together. And I heard the bishop say that today. We're in this together. We are church together. Um, that's such a powerful statement to always be brought back to. We are together uh, following Christ in this um, particular time and place that we're called into ministry. 
And I also thought for those lectionary preachers out there, right, because I'm a lectionary preacher in a lectionary church, I can't get away from it. So on, I think, the eighth Sunday of the coronavirus, which is this upcoming Sunday in my world, um, I was thinking a lot about that First Peter 3 passage, right? Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands for you an accounting of the hope that is within you. In my small group, uh, after we lamented the challenges and we were grieving the challenges and the difficulties and the, the cost of this time to individuals and groups, um, a Jason who was facilitating us said, now let's talk about the hope because we're Lutherans and we like those dichotomies, saint and sinner, law and gospel, grief and hope. We can't forget about the hope. And so what I thought about is um, at my house, we had to um, engage our hope toolbox. So every day we sit down at the table um, when I'm here with my son over lunch and we talk about where is the place that you see hope? Because we want to account for the hope that is within us so that we don't let the grief swallow us whole. Uh, so I heard that all in our conversation today, and that is sort of what I thought about as we gathered up all the many things that we talked about. But our hope toolbox uh, filled with the Holy Spirit um, guide us forward in this challenging and difficult time. Now, we've been using all the resources of faith where I'm at, and that even includes, uh, right, our, uh, for those of you who use this, our ELW pastoral care book. That's gotten a lot of use in my world lately. So actually, I'm going to use a prayer from that and then just send us off with the blessing. Um, so let us pray. Almighty God, your love never fails and you can turn the shadow of death into daybreak. Help us to receive your word with believing hearts so that confident in your promises we may have hope and be lifted out of sorrow into the peace of your holy presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 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 And now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine on us with grace and mercy. And may the Lord look upon us with favor and give us hope and peace. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor.